religious organizations. If you want to feel super confident on this topic, you won't want to miss a second of this video. I'm going to explain the main ways of classifying religious organizations, all the key concepts that you need to know. And at the very end of the video, I'm going to explain the common, no super common mistakes students make when writing about religious organizations in their sociology exam. Tom from the sociologytutor.com here. I want to help you learn more sociology and succeed in life. Let's get started. Trolch distinguished between churches and sects. So a church refers to any major world religion, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism, Judaism. So when we think church, we're going to think Christianity naturally, but we need to remember actually it refers to all major world religions. Now what do they all have in common? They tend to all have a strict hierarchy and structure to be highly organized they tend to see society as okay as you know acceptable so they're not offering radical alternatives in this sense they tend to be quite conservative that's one of the words we can use so they're quite conservative they don't offer radical change they tend to recruit many you know millions of members of course so they're going to have a very wide membership and of course if you're a member of a church you can't be a member of another religious organization and in many cases, churches will be closely linked to the government or the state. So for example, the Church of England is the, the church which you know, represents the state, the government, you know, it runs all the royal marriages, funerals, etc. So I've done a whole episode on a set, so you can go and look at that and why they exist. But briefly, they are opposed to societies you know, values, ideas, they're rejecting society. They require a very high level of religious commitment. Unlike a church, which may require quite minimal commitment, really going along perhaps once a week and not major alterations to your life, a sect is gonna require wholesale changes to your life. They may be giving up relationships, wealth. They're very radical, so they're opposed to society and they want radical change often, or certainly radical um, action for the membership of the sect. Again, they claim a monopoly of truth. You can't be a member of another organization, religious organization, if you're a member of a sect. A sect is led by a charismatic leader and it's much less well organized. There's not really a hierarchy of other people. You've got the sect leader him, him, him or herself and there might be a few other leaders, but it's not organized and structured in the way that a church is. If you're getting value from this video, hit the subscribe button and remember, head over to the sociologytutor.com for more resources. Links in the description below. Now back to the video. The denomination lies between a church and a sect. So some of the key features of it, it's more organized than a sect, although it's not gonna be as organized as a church. There are gonna be professional leaders but it's gonna be less hierarchical. It's generally accepting of society, but the message will still be slightly more radical, slightly more non-conformist. They're not as anywhere near as radical as a sect. They're not opposing society or against it, but they're not quite as accepting as a church. So they're gonna be challenging to some degree some of the ideas of society, and they require slightly more commitment than than churches. A denomination might ask a bit more in terms of a lifestyle change, perhaps to give up alcohol, for example. So a good example is the Methodist Church. Denominations tend to be much smaller and they often actually form out of a sect. So I've done a whole video on sect, but denominations often form out of sects that have you know, cooled down and become more organized. Cult refers to most loosely organized of all the organizations we've looked at, and it takes a much more individualistic approach. So it's much less hierarchical. In many cases, a cult is often providing like a service, a therapy, a, a way of doing things such as meditating. And once the person has acquired the skill or the knowledge, they no longer have any contact with the, the cult. So cults tend to be short-lived. They've got much smaller um, numbers. Like denominations, they're tolerant of other um, belief systems. They're not trying to claim often a monopoly of truth. Often they borrow ideas from a range of different belief systems and 
ideas. In Stark and Bainbridge's view, cults are opposed to societies, much like a sect is as well. Audience cults. Now, an audience cult is one, as the title suggests, where you are just the audience. You don't really participate in any meaningful way. So it could be going online to watch videos, you know, reading online, reading books, etc. So an audience cult is you're a member of it, but you're not really interacting with other members of the cult. So again, you can see it's very individualistic. You take from it what you want, really. There's no sort of strict hierarchy or structure here, although there may be a leader you know, of the cult overall. The second type she talks about is a client cult. So a client cult is one in which you are a client, you're a customer. So you buy a service from the cult. So it may be that you go to classes that will teach you transcendental meditation. And in that case, obviously your participation is gonna be much more involved and you are paying for a particular service in this instance. So a client cult, as we said, paying for a service more involvement you know but again once the service has been acquired you, you may not go back to it the final different type of cult is called a cultic movement and they actually seek to transform every aspect of a person's life so they they sound almost more like a sex so a cultic movement as we said will require high levels of commitment they would seek to transform all aspects of someone's life and they're going to have like much larger larger memberships more formally organized they're more likely to have a sort of strict sort of charismatic leader. So an example of that for Stark and Bainbridge would be the Church of Scientology. Now this term is from Wallace and he classifies three different types of new religious movements. New religious movements emerged in the 1960s and this term is used to describe a very wide range of different religious movements that were forming. A lot of people would argue this wide range of new religious movements is evidence against secularisation. They accept that traditional religion has declined, but new religious movements are in some ways taking the place of those sort of traditional religions. Now Wallace classifies them based on their relationship to society. The first one is called World Rejecting New Religious Movements. Now, as you can guess, they're rejecting society. They're highly critical of society's norms and values. They believe that society needs to change radically. So they place very high demands on their members. They will be religious in the sense that they'll have religious scriptures to read and they will have a, a God-like figure of some type. Who they worship so they are similar to organized religions in those ways but they also sound like and they share a lot of the features of a, a sect so as we said members have to give up their lifestyles world rejecting new religious movements are often small but they can be very large they can go up to hundreds of thousands at the other end of the extreme you've got world affirming new religious movements now world affirming new religious movements are very positive about you know life society etc so they're not rejecting society's values um, people don't have to give up their jobs to to join them and what they will teach usually is techniques which can be used to make your life better so for example meditation they might teach they might teach some sort of physical activity and their message is always that if you come to us we're going to be able to improve your life by teaching you a technique teaching you um, some new type of knowledge which you can use to you know improve your life so they don't demand big changes in people's lives at all they don't demand any change in people's lives they're tolerant of other ideas belief systems etc they often involve people paying for a service they get taught how to do something and then they pay for that those lessons the sort of people who tend to go to it are middle class middle aged peak professionals perhaps who have become slightly disillusioned with their life and they want a new way of enhancing their, their life, enhancing their experience. Again, they're gonna be quite individualistic, gonna usually be a personal experience which people have, which can you know sort of develop themselves. So the final classification is world accommodating. Now world accommodating groups are religious organizations that have formed out of a previous religious organization, for example, a church, and they feel that that church has lost the sort of spiritual purity or they're missing some part of the message that they need to focus on. So world accommodating groups tend to focus on the individual 
personal connection with you know the holy spirit or or god or whatever figure it is that they feel they've been missing in their mainstream religion now people following this type of organization tend to lead very conventional lives so their view of society will be fairly neutral evaluate the reasons for the growth in new religious movements and new age movements in recent years that's a typical essay question in the exam most students will answer that without separating new religious movements from new age movements they've got some similarities some similar reasons why they've grown but ultimately they're quite different organizations they've emerged at different times they attract different people you should be separating the organizations in your answers having individual paragraphs in your essays where you're explaining what's different about each type of organization that's the first common mistake people make if you get a question and it includes more than one type of religious organization you need to make sure you're covering them both individually don't lump them in together second most common problem is when talking about religious organizations people don't really go back to the actual definition of the organization they'll write something like new religious movements are popular because they are less authoritarian and less hierarchical than traditional religions and then perhaps not go into any more details any more examples about you know why that's the case what are the characteristics of new religious movements which type of new religious movement are you talking about so it's really essential that you go back to those definitions in your answers and you don't talk about the organizations without really carefully defining them what you need to do now to make sure you've got all the information to answer a question on religious organizations is watch the video on new age movements and watch the evaluation of new religious movements take care thanks for listening